Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. All participants are in a listen-only mode. You have the opportunity to ask questions from our panelists and to raise any technical issues you may be experiencing by using the question box on the right-hand side of your screen. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and the recording near slides will be made available on the NILK website, NILK's Facebook page, and emailed to all registrants. It is now my pleasure to turn today's program over to Joanna Cuevas Ingram, staff attorney at NILK. Thank you, Ignacia. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Workers' Rights, Critical Labor Protections for Immigrant Workers During the COVID-19 Pandemic, brought to you by the National Immigration Law Center. As everyone here is, is aware, the COVID-19 public health crisis is creating many challenges for immigrant workers and their families. An estimated 6 million immigrants are in essential jobs at the front lines of the response to this pandemic. They work in industries such as healthcare, grocery, pharmacy, retail, manufacturing, cleaning, janitorial services, and agriculture. An additional 6 million foreign-born workers are employed in industries that have been hard hit by business closures, including food service, travel, hospitality, personal services, and private household work and building services. It's critical that all immigrants know their rights at work and have the information and protections they need to ensure their health, safety, and well-being during this unprecedented time. Many resources are available to address various aspects of this crisis. And this presentation, along with the resources that we will be providing at the end of the presentation, are designed to answer frequently asked questions from immigrant workers and their advocates related to COVID-19. Where possible, we will also include links to additional information on various topics, as this is an evolving area of policy, and this presentation and these resources will be updated to reflect the rapidly changing nature of this issue. In this webinar, our, pres our presenters will discuss several areas of workers' rights as they relate to immigrant workers and the COVID-19 pandemic. These protections are covered in a new Know Your Rights resource co-authored by NILF, the National Employment Law Project, and the Occupational Safety and Health Law Project. This new resource and this webinar are designed to answer frequently asked questions, again, from immigrant workers and their advocates related to COVID-19 in areas such as safety and health on the job, using collective action to improve workplace safety and health, paid and unpaid time off from work, and unemployment insurance. In addition, the presenters will discuss how changes in recent federal COVID-19 relief legislation impact okay. immigrant workers in the areas of paid sick leave, paid family leave, and unemployment insurance. With that, I'd like to introduce our panelists. They include Emily Tully, uh, Senior Attorney, Occupational Safety and Health Law Project, Ingrid Nava, Associate General Counsel at SEIU Local 32BJ, Rebecca Smith, Director of Work Structures at the National Employment Law Project, and Jesse Hahn, Labor and Employment, Labor and Employment Policy here at the National Immigration Law Center. Next slide, please. So just to give everyone an overview of our presentation today and how we'll be organizing the information, uh, as we've given our introduction, we will move to our next presentation uh, on safety and health on the job. Then we'll talk about using collective action to improve workplace safety and health, unemployment insurance, paid and unpaid time off from work, state and local responses springing up to address gaps left by federal response, and Q&A and resources. Before I move to the next slide and our first presenter, I just want to remind everyone that due to the high volume uh, participants on today's webinar, uh, we may experience some te technical difficulties. And if that is the case, we apologize in advance. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties during this webinar, please uh, please let us know using the questions box on the, on the right-hand side of your screen, including if you're having difficulty hearing the speakers. And please also note that today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the NILK website and on NILK's Facebook page. If you, wish, if you wish to ask a question, please use the questions box located again on the right side of your screen to enter your question at any time. We will have time at the end of the webinar to answer your questions. And with that, let's move to our first speaker. Next slide. Emily Tully, Senior Attorney at Occupational Safety and Health Law Project, will talk to us about safety and health on the job. Emily? Can you hear me now? Yes, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for holding tight. Emily, uh, please, okay. please uh, start us off here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, technology is not my forte. So thanks so much for um, joining us today. Um, my name is Emily Tully, as folks said, and I'm here today with the Ash Law Project. 
Um, for folks who aren't familiar with our work, we're a relatively new organization that focuses exclusively on worker health and safety. Um, I've created this presentation uh, to really think about the audience that we have today and with the understanding that most folks on the call aren't necessarily in the health and safety movement and don't necessarily travel in that space. So um, I'm gonna hit on really the pieces that I think are most critical and I trust that we will have time at the end for folks to ask questions or if folks wanna email me offline to dig a little deeper, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, so next slide. So today we're gonna to focus on um, a couple of key areas. We're gonna talk about enforcement of health and safety laws and the limitations that go with that. Um, we're going to talk about complaints to OSHA and beyond, and we're gonna talk about anti-retaliation protections under health and safety law. Next slide. So let's start a bit with the framework of um, how health and safety law is enforced. Again, just so that everyone has a shared understanding. Um, OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration and it's part of the federal government. It enforces the OSHA. The OSHA gives workers the right to a safe and healthful, um, safe and healthful working conditions. And it imposes requirements on employers around those um, safe and healthful working conditions. It's the primary federal law around health and safety, and it protects workers regardless of immigration status. You'll see on the slide here, there's also a map of um, state plan states. So in some of the country, OSHA enforces health and safety law. In 22 states and territories, the state government has its own health and safety agency and it enforces health and safety law itself. These are referred to as state plan states. For our purposes, we aren't gonna dive deep here, but it's just worth taking a look at that map, maybe following up after the webinar and knowing if you are in a state plan state, because there are certain implications to that. Next slide. Great. So, under the OSH Act, um, employers have a responsibility, it's known as the general duty clause in the act, to provide workplaces that are free of known hazards that could harm employees. Um, employee, employers are also required to comply with health and safety standards, which are rules, essentially. Um, so typically, if a worker experiences a violation of her health and safety rights on the job, she would file a complaint and assuming that complaint describes conditions that violated the OSH Act, OSHA would conduct an inspection. And if they found a violation of a standard, one of those rules, or of that general duty clause that need to provide a workplace free of known hazards that could harm employees, OSHA would issue a citation. Um, citations have financial penalties for employers and they also have an abatement date. And that's the date that hazards have to be corrected. Uh, OSHA doesn't have a specific standard on COVID-19. And until Monday, it actually looked like they weren't going to um, conduct any COVID-19 related inspections at all, even in healthcare. Um, on Monday, things changed and OSHA issued new enforcement guidance that prioritized for inspection workplaces that have fatalities and imminent danger exposures. And I think the best way to think about this is really um, the guidance. We went from a world where there were no COVID-19 related inspections at all to a world where there will be some in really the most egregious circumstances we can imagine for healthcare workers who are being exposed to COVID on the job and who don't have personal protective equipment. Although there's not a um, COVID specific standard, there's not a COVID specific rule, there are other standards that might apply in this COVID era. Um, so for instance, there's a requirement that employers have to have running water and hand soap. That's an existing standard that was there before COVID, but is particularly relevant now. So if a worker wanted to file a complaint, OSHA might be willing to conduct an inspection based on a violation of that hazard. All right, um, let's uh, maybe just to put a finer point on it, 
all other workers with potential exposures, or most other workers, it's probably safe to say, OSHA is not going to be willing to investigate at this moment. Instead, they're not going to go to the work site, but they will process complaints informally, which means investigators will contact the employer by phone or email, and they'll try and get the employer to abate to stop the hazards. At this moment, even though OSHA is not conducting inspections related to COVID-19, workers should really still consider filing a complaint, and particularly when there are very egregious violations that pose an immediate danger to workers' health and safety. Um, workers can also consider calling a local health department about conditions that they think are violating workers' health and safety. If OSHA conducts an inspection, the investigator should not ask about the worker's immigration status, and even if the investigator does ask about the status, workers are under no obligation to answer an OSHA inspector's question about the status. It's worth noting here that in agencies and state plan states make to be more address Apolo apologies if, everyone, if folks who are not presenting can mute their line please so we can hear emily that would be great thank you thank you please please continue emily. great thanks um so it's worth noting here that enforcement agencies and state plan states can be more aggressive in their enforcement efforts so i've talked a lot about OSHA inspectors, but if you're in a state plan state, there could be more aggressive enforcement. It's also worth noting that what I'm laying out here, the lack of inspections in this era, it's moving very quickly. Like I said, things changed on Monday of this week, and we need to update the FAQ that this webinar is based on. So um, be sure to check in as this is an evolving area. Um, one final point that I wanted to note um, and underline a bit, if we're in a situation, if you're in a situation where you filed a complaint and OSHA is conducting an inspection, the investigator shouldn't ask about the worker's immigration status. And even if they do, workers are under no obligation to answer an OSHA inspector's questions about immigration status. So let's talk a little bit um, here about um, retaliation. We can pause for a moment. Um, and actually, if we wouldn't mind going back one slide. Awesome, okay, thank you. So let's talk a little bit about anti-retaliation protections under health and safety law. Um, 11C, Section 11C of the OSHA Act protects most workers from retaliation if they assert their rights under the act, and that includes workers who are retaliated against after complaining about a violation of health and safety rights on the job. 11C is really broad, and in the COVID era, it would include protection for things like filing a complaint, but would also provide protection for something as simple as expressing concerns to your supervisor about workplace conditions. The law prohibits retaliation like an employer's firing or mistreatment of an employee based on the exercise of those rights. But the retaliation could also look like immigration-based retaliation. So a worker complains about working conditions to a boss and the employer threatens to call ICE or the local police on an immigrant worker. Um, again, like um, like we were discussing before, 11C protects workers regardless of immigration status. So that's kind of the good on 11C. The reality is that in practice, these anti-retaliation provisions are really weak. And when Ingrid discusses the NLRA, we'll hear a little bit more about the value of really pairing the anti-retaliation provisions of the OSH Act with the, those of the NLRA. So some of the weaknesses briefly, um, the statute of limitations, how long a worker has to file is only 30 days. There's some equitable tolling, meaning that workers may be able to file later than 30 days in certain limited circumstances, but generally we should think of it as a very short statute of limitations. Um, these claims take a long time to resolve. And um, so generally speaking, it's a relatively weak anti-retaliation provision. So briefly, um, we're just gonna talk about um, uh, OSHA complaints and how workers can file. A few quick things to remember if you choose to file. Workers can file a complaint by phone or on the OSHA website, and that complaint could include facts suggesting that an employer is violating the OSHA Act. 
it should cite relevant guidance. Um, and we discussed some of that, but I'm happy to give folks sites and resources on that. It should also cite any violations of standards or those rules that OSHA enforces. Um, any worker can file a complaint and she can ask OSHA not to reveal her name as part of that process. Technically, a worker can file an anonymous OSHA complaint, but it's stronger instead to have an organization file on the worker's behalf. Um, there's a specific process for that, and I'm happy to talk with folks who are interested in doing that, having an organization file on the worker's behalf. In most cases, unless the situation is really egregious, like we discussed, you can in this moment expect OSHA to call the employer, ask some questions, and encourage the employer to follow OSHA's guidance. Um, again, just to reiterate, so we want to keep abreast of how things roll out and how things move forward. Um, workers can file OSHA complaints in any language, and if workers are represented by a labor union, they may have more rights than we discussed here. I'd encourage them to reach out to their union reps or union attorneys for more information. Next slide. So some takeaways. Um, uh, just if you get nothing else from this, remember these key points. All workers are protected by health and safety law, regardless of immigration status. Protection of workers' health and safety is critical, but filing a complaint is not a silver bullet. It's, it's a useful tool. Um, one thing I didn't mention, but maybe I should reiterate here, in addition to filing a health and safety complaint with OSHA or with your state agency, who may be more willing to act on that complaint, you can also send that complaint to local media, right, as part of a larger advocacy effort to ensure that workers are able to have um, safe and healthy workplaces. Um, workers are in the strongest position when they have the protection of the NLRA and the OSH Act, anti-retaliation provisions, and change is possible. We just saw, as I said on Monday, recent, recent changes to OSHA guidance, and um, I think we can con continue to see those if advocates ask for it and demand it. Um, so with that, I will um, turn it back over to Joanna. Thank you, Emily. Thank you so much. I think it's really critical that folks understand as we move to the next presentation by Ingrid Nava um, that uh, collective action um, is really critical under the National Labor Relations Act and that workers actually don't need to have a union. We'll learn more from Ingrid about this, although having a union uh, provides more protection. Workers don't need to have a union in order to, to join together to demand health and safety protocols um, for their own health and safety as a collective at the workplace. So let's hear more about collective action to improve workplace safety and health from Ingrid Nava, Associate General Counsel, SEIU Local 32BJ. Ingrid, thank you. While we're waiting for Ingrid to dial in, just want to mention again that how important it is uh, that workers take advantage of their rights under the National Labor Relations Act. Across the United States, workers are doing essential jobs and they continue reporting to them, keeping grocery shelves stocked and stores sanitized, laboring at construction sites, preparing and delivering packages to our doors, collecting trash, keeping communities clean, harvesting and processing the food that keeps our supply chains running and our refrigerators stocked. As I mentioned at the top of the presentation, approximately 6 million essential workers are immigrants, yet immigrant workers who are so essential and integral to our collective health and survival, all of us immigrants or not, during this unprecedented COVID-19 public health crisis have been left without meaningful protections for their own health and safety on the job. Again, collective action may be a powerful way that workers can join together and demand access to health and safety precautions, protocols, and personal protective equipment, PPE. <laughs> Is that Ingrid, are you on now? I am, yep. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, okay, great. Thanks everyone for holding tight and apologies again for these technical difficulties, please bear with us and Ingrid, please let us know how we can learn more about collective action. Thank you. Okay, all right, I will try to be efficient. Uh, so first of all, let me just uh, introduce myself a little bit more. Uh, I am Ingrid Nava, I'm Associate General Counsel at SEIU Local 32BJ. Um, and that 32BJ, for those of you who don't know, is a property service union. Um, we represent janitors, security guards, residential building cleaners, um, airport passenger service workers, many property service workers across the East Coast. And um, we have a very high percentage of immigrant workers in these frontline jobs, um, and many of them are classified as essential workers. And I also want to mention, um, and I put it in the slide here, that I am an executive board member of Justice at Work, and the reason I mention that 
Justice at Work is a legal services organization that serves immigrant worker centers in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Um, and I'm mentioning that because I've been in a lot of close contact with the staff there over since the onset of the COVID crisis. And the issues that they're dealing with and my conversations with them have also informed um, my presentation today. Next slide. Okay, good, got it. Um, the way I wanna orient uh, the discussion that I'm gonna have is to plant two questions in your head, which I would consider like two guiding questions. The first that you see here is when and how can workers protest to improve health and safety in the workplace? And by protest, I mean take collective action. So I'll talk about when and how they can do that. And then the other question is um, when a, a worker or a group of workers refuses to work because of health and safety concerns, in what circumstance will that refusal of work be protected? And the main distinction that I'm drawing between the way that these two questions are posed is that in the first set of circumstances, you would be planning with the workers how to take elective action. In the second set of circumstances, you are most likely reacting to the fact that a work stoppage happened, which I think in our current context, um, it's, uh, there's a much likely, there's a much higher likelihood that this will happen because there's so many workers out there who are really just terrified, you know, having to do the work that they've done daily for years and having to face that. So there are workers who are reacting and deciding not to, not to work. And you will face, I think many of you will face that situation as well. Next slide, please. So um, as the next slide is queuing up, I will say, as, as many of you know, the National Labor Relations Act is the primary statute that protects worker collective action. Uh, and the specific provision of the National Labor Relations Act that spells out um, the protection is, is Section 7. And so it's often referred to as Section 7 or Section 7 rights. So um, as you can see here, the Section 7 is written out. I bolded uh, the words employee concerted activity and concerted activity for mutual aid and protection. Um, so Section 7, what Section 7 protects is concerted activity uh, that employees take for mutual aid and protection. Um, there are several things that need to be that you need to be concerned with when you are uh, preparing workers to take action, to take uh, co collective action to address health and safety in the workplace. And now you can go to the next slide. First, you need to make sure that uh, the employees that you are working with are employees as they're defined in the National Labor Relations Act. So uh, the National Labor Relations Act does cover uh, most private sector workers, but it does not cover agricultural laborers, domestic service workers, uh, railway and airline workers, which are governed by the uh, Railway Labor Act, supervisors and managers, and independent contractors. And this is an important consideration as you are working um, particularly with uh, immigrant worker populations because uh, agricultural laborers, domestic service workers, um, are you know places where immigrants are disproportionately represented, and also there are many industries in which people will be called supervisors or managers, but may be acting as frontline workers, and/or may be called independent contractors, even though they may appear to be an employee. And so, understanding and teasing out uh, what their actual status is will inform whether or not they're protected or not. But if they are an employee under the Act then they are, uh, they, they are able to take concerted action, um, concerted activity for mutual aid and protection. And so what is concerted action? It's almost any action that workers take together to improve wages, benefits, or working conditions. Health and safety conditions in the workplace, either having to do with, an equipment, with equipment, uh, like personal protective equipment, um, or having to do with cleaning protocols or adjustment to schedules, or to tasks or practices in the workplace and how those should change, like for example, with the punch clock, anything like that. All of those have to do with working conditions and they are very clearly um, protected. Actions around those things are very clearly protected by Section 7. Um, I will say that if you are considering, and, and the list here uh, lists some ideas of the kinds of activities people might take or that would be protected. This includes talking with one or more coworkers about these issues, circulating petitions or delivering petitions, 
participating in a work stoppage, like a strike. Uh, delegations to management, petitioning a government or agency together around your workplace issues. All of those are the activities that would be protected by Section 7 of the NLRA. Um, I will say that if workers are considering doing a strike or a work stoppage, that uh, it really is advisable that you speak with a labor lawyer about your particular uh, plan, because there are many wrinkles when you're uh, thinking about a strike that need to be taken into account. Uh, I know that there have been, there's been some chatter about intermittent strikes and there was a bad board decision um, several months ago involving Walmart uh, that basically held uh, that striking over the, well, striking over the same issue is prohibited by the NLRA, by the act itself. How the same issue, the quote unquote same issue is interpreted um, has evolved and there has been a bad decision over the past several months or several months ago that, that makes it much harder uh, to strike more than once about things that are related. So um, among many other reasons, that is a reason to check in with uh, Labor Council. Um, and then the other thing I will say is that if workers are working under a contract, uh, their if they have a union contract, that union contract must be consulted uh, because it's not only the strike work stoppage that is affected by a no strike clause, but the no strike clause modifies Section 7 activity and what's permitted in general. So strike clauses may have provisions that say you can't go to the press or that you can't hold a sign in front of the workplace or things of that nature. So if workers are under a, a union contract, the, the union contract must be consulted before um, deciding what collective activity they should engage in. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention is that uh, what is mutual, what is acting collectively or what is mutual aid? Um, so in the past, there have been times where a single worker uh, acting on behalf of the rest of the workplace has been deemed to be acting concertedly uh, because the action was about the rest of the workforce. It was for mutual aid. And so therefore the board had determined that action was inherently co uh, concerted. This kind of reasoning is much less likely with the current NLRB, which are currently all, there are three of them on the board. Uh, should, you, normally a full board is a five person membership. Currently there are only three and they are all Trump appointees. Um, so this came up in uh, with a group called Pescando Justicia in New Bedford, which is a group of immigrant workers that um, represent many different workers in many different industry, in many different factories. They delivered a letter factory-wide, industry-wide, um, saying that they wanted certain, making certain demands about health and safety during the COVID crisis. They decided that in the locations where they only had one worker, uh, as part of that committee, that the best thing to do was to email and not to deliver in a delegation because it is not clear that the one person delivering, even though it's you know for the good of the whole workforce, would be protected uh, necessarily by Section 7 of the NLRA in that circumstance. Next slide, please. So in addition to Section 7, there's also another provision um, We'll see it as referred to as a provision of the NLRA, and it is part of the NLRA. It was originally passed um, as, a, as a section of the Labor Management Relations Act that says that the quitting of, uh, quitting of labor by an employee or employee in good faith because of abnormally dangerous conditions for, for work at the place of employment um, shall not be deemed a strike under the, uh, under the NLRA. Um, the thing to note about this is that this is really an objective standard, meaning uh, that one, there has to be a good faith belief that the condition was abnormally dangerous. 
Uh, and then there has to be also causation that, in other words, that the belief of that condition caused the work stoppage. And then finally, it also has to be, the belief has to be supported by ascertainable objective evidence um, that there was actually a perceived, there was actually a danger posed or an immediate threat of harm in order for that work stoppage to fall under this category to be not a strike and therefore protected. Basically what this does, what this provision says is if, if somebody, if a worker, uh, and where, where I have had experience this has come up is window washers. They get up to the top roof, say, and uh, the hook that they're supposed to have, uh, the specific kind of, you know, cable or whatever, does, is not there or it's broken. Um, they can decide not to work in that moment because the belief in that moment that they will put themselves in immediate danger um, and have an immediate threat to their health or safety it is real. If they do that, the NLRA says that is not a strike. And meaning that even though they're under a no strike clause, their failure to you know, carry out the duties that they're supposed to carry out is not a work stoppage. And therefore, um, it shouldn't be punished like an illegal strike in that circumstance. So this is something to keep in mind. There is a right to refuse very dangerous work. Um, but really, if workers want to uh, protest or act collectively to improve health and safety, they normally need to be looking to Section 7 of the National Labor Relations Act and what that governs in order to guide the decisions about how to engage in collective action um, to address those issues. Next slide. And finally, um, I just wanted to mention that the OSH Act also has a provision um, listed here that says, um, while as a general matter, there's no right to walk off the job, um, there can be occasions in which an employee is confronted with a choice between engaging in their task or risking serious injury or death. And in that case, if the worker refuses to work, they can be protected from discharge. And so this is in a lot of ways similar to Section 502 that I just mentioned. It's when a, it, 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 it uh, applies when a worker or a group of workers is really facing in the immediate circumstance a, um, an abnormally dangerous condition that if they engage in it, is going to threaten their health and safety, uh, and they decide not to do it. They're deciding not to do it could be protected in that circumstance. It needs to be also um, something that they cannot have addressed previously, or that uh, going through normal channels to get it addressed in the future would be insufficient because the danger is so immediate. So again, this is not something that you can use to sort of proactively organize with, but it can be something to rely on if workers have decided not to engage in activity that they thought was very dangerous. Um, so I think I will leave it there and uh, take questions at the end. Great. Thank you so much, Ingrid, for the wealth of knowledge uh, you've been able to share with us about, particularly about Section 7 of the National Labor Relations Act. As we move to the next slide and our next presenter, uh, we wanted to thank everyone for bearing with us through these technical difficulties. We have over 903 people here currently in attendance. So I want to thank you all for sticking with us. We know that um, th this information is critical and we want to get it to you in a timely manner. We're just dealing with some technical difficulties due to the high volume of participants. So as we switch over uh, to the next presentation, um, we, we wanted to make sure um, folks were aware of the connections here with unemployment insurance. And, and we know a lot of folks right now are experiencing job loss. And there appears to be a patchwork 
uh, of support um, for job loss. And we want to hear more about that from Rebecca Smith, Director of Work Structures at the National Employment Law Project, who will talk to us about unemployment insurance and eligibility for unemployment insurance, or UI, and where there is no eligibility at the state level, what other options might be available and resources as well. So let's hear from Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Joanna. Can you hear me? Yes. Very good. Thanks very much. And thanks to Nilk for um, convening us all today. And I can't believe there are 900 people on the phone. Um, yeah, we're going to switch gears a little bit from workers who are working harder than ever and risking their health in the process to workers who are not working or not working enough and risking financial ruin. Um, and so I'm going to talk about what the unemployment insurance laws are, basically, both the basic state-funded unemployment insurance system that's with us all the time and the emergency assistance that's now available and the limitations for immigrant workers. And as you'll see, there are millions and millions of people who are left out of this system and who have been traditionally for decades. So let's start with you know unemployment insurance basics. This is a system that is available in every state and it's available to all workers who are unemployed and it's not their fault that they're unemployed. Um, workers get a part of the wages that they were earning in the last year to 18 months. The programs are administered by the state. So when you're unemployed, you apply at your state uh, employment development department, employment office, they're called different things in different places. They are paid for generally at the state level by employer taxes. And then when there are disasters or recessions, often federal funds are made available and often those are called disaster unemployment assistance. In this pandemic, it's called pandemic unemployment assistance. Um, in order to qualify, you have to earn a certain amount or work a certain number of hours in a couple of states during what's called a base period. And that's essentially, depending on when you apply in a quarter, it's between 12 and 18 months, and you'll generally be asked for uh, your wages during that time, or they will be reported already into the system by your employer. And you must be able and available, they say, and actively seeking work in order to qualify. That's for basic state unemployment insurance. And these rules apply um, in every state because the federal government has some basic uh, regulations and guidance around unemployment insurance that the states must follow and then the states have additional leeway. Next slide, please. So here are the general rules about immigrant workers eligibility for the basic state unemployment insurance that's available. And I should say, if I didn't, for generally for 26 weeks while you're unemployed. So the two basic general rules, um, undocumented workers are not eligible for state unemployment insurance, um, nor are they eligible for any federally funded unemployment insurance. U.S. Department of Labor has guidance to the states, um, and DOL's guidance essentially says workers have to have work authorization at the time they apply for benefits and throughout the time they're receiving benefits and also during that base period that I mentioned. So the time that they earned the wages. Um, and they say this because uh, you have to be essentially you know, lawfully earning wages. And then they say that to be able and available for work, that means legally able and available for work, and you have to have work authorization. DOL in its guidance, which is very old, mentions some specific categories of workers. So anyone whose work authorization 
is inherent in their status, like lawful, lawful permanent residents, refugees, as I leave, some applicants for um, asylum, and folks who are part of the compact of freely associated states. They also say that workers who have work authorization during that base period and now also will uh, qualify for the state-funded unemployment insurance. So DACA recipients, yes. TPS recipients and applicants with work authorization, yes. Applications for cancellation of removal, so it really just hinges on that EAD. Uh, next slide, please. DOL in the past has also issued guidance about federally funded benefits, those times of disasters and recessions where money is made available by the federal government to pay for unemployment insurance benefits to workers. And they, they have said in the past that for federally funded benefits, only qualified aliens are eligible. And they have said that because of the old Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity, yeah. I forget, Act, PERWA. Um, and they have listed out just these particular um, categories of folks who are eligible for federally funded benefits. Next slide, please. So now we get to the new benefits that are available, the federally funded benefits. And I'm just gonna go over what they provide for workers, um, basically. Um, and again, we do not know, and DOL has not said, whether these benefits will be subject to the same rule as other federally funded benefits. So the CARES Act, um, which passed, uh, I believe, March 27th, was signed into law, provides for a couple of different programs, pandemic unemployment assistance, and then I'll talk about um, pandemic extended unemployment compensation. They, they, the names are so similar that it's hard to get them straight. Um, so pandemic unemployment assistance covers workers who are not eligible for regular unemployment. And DOL has said, for example, the self-employed, for example, part-time workers in some states, workers who don't have enough wage history in that base period that I talked about would be eligible, are eligible for PUA. Um, it will pay 39 weeks of benefits and it's retroactive to January 27th. And it if has someone, if someone, a, I'm sorry, so sorry to interrupt. If someone has sure. unmuted their line, please mute your line if you're not presenting. Thank you. Sorry. And then there are particular conditions that are covered. This is a temporary program. It's just for the pandemic, and then it will um, no longer be active. So it covers workers who have been diagnosed, if you're caring for a family member or caring for someone else who's been diagnosed, it covers providing for a child or another household member who can't attend school. So that's an important piece. Um, it covers folks who are quarantined. And, and by that, I mean um, specifically quarantined because you've been advised by a doctor to self-quarantine, not emergency rules. It covers people who are forced to quit as a result of COVID-19 and work, uh, people whose work is closed because of COVID-19. And that's the um, emergency orders that have come down through, I think, all of the states at this point. Next slide, please. And I should say that um, pandemic unemployment assistance uh, retroactive to January 27th and ends at the end of this month. The other uh, piece of the federal law that I think is uh, most relevant is pandemic unemployment compensation. So this is just simply a boost in weekly benefits for anyone who receives any amount of pandemic unemployment assistance or regular UI, you will get a $600 boost in your weekly benefits. That is very temporary. It ends July 31st. 
And in most states, um, these programs are just starting to be up and running. Um, the best way to know whether your state has implemented either of the federal programs yet is to take a look at your state's website. Most people apply through the state's website and it will tell you um, particular rules for applying in your state. There is also a third program called Pandemic Emergency Unemployment Compensation. Uh, see what I mean about them all sounding very similar. <laughs> this one is also available through the end of the year and it, it's for folks who have run out of state unemployment insurance benefits. It's the same uh, benefit level as state unemployment insurance. So that's the basics in terms of regular state UI and then the temporary programs that are available right now. The basic rules for immigrants is that you must for state unemployment insurance have work authorization and we do not know yet uh, because there is no specific guidance whether the rules will be more stringent for um, the federal systems. In the meantime, because so many people will be left out um, and are being left out of these systems, there are folks across the country that are thinking about other ways that we can get emergency assistance or an alternative unemployment insurance system and make that available to immigrant communities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much again. Uh, we're going to hear now from my colleague, our colleague, Jesse Hahn, who will be talking to us about, you know, who is included and who has been left out um, in the federal response and also what can be doing um, in terms of the state and local response and, and what state and local responses have uh, really uh, stepped up in terms of providing. Um, more support uh, to immigrant workers with regard to paid and unpaid time off from work. And so we'll we'll hear more now from Jesse Hahn, Labor and Employment Policy Attorney at the National Immigration Law Center. Jesse. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Um, hi everyone, thank you for joining the webinar. Um, we're so glad that you could join us. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, paid sick and paid family leave and then at the end I'm going to talk just briefly about some of the new initiatives that we're seeing come out on the state and local level to try to fill some of the gaps uh, left by the federal uh, coronavirus relief legislation. So um, with regards to paid leave, um, at a time when many low-wage workers are being exposed to COVID-19 at work, and the CDC has recommended to the general public that they self-quarantine for 14 days after exposure to someone with the virus. It really is more critical than ever that workers be able to take time off from work without suffering a reduction in pay. But we know that for many low-wage workers, access to paid sick leave and paid family leave are just a luxury that they have never experienced. And uh, they are being forced to choose right now between risking their health and the health of their families uh, with having income to cover their basic needs. So while there has been some recent federal legislation that addresses these disparities for some workers, there really is just so much more that is needed to fill in the gaps left by the federal laws. Um, as you can see on the slide, uh, only 31% of workers in the lowest quarter of earnings, so it's making 1080 an hour or less, have access to paid sick leave. I should say these figures are from before the uh, recent federal legislation was passed. And then there's some also some very stark racial and ethnic disparities in terms of to who has access to paid sick leave. So if we can advance to the next slide, paid and unpaid time off from work. So I wanted to just quickly make clear what the two major categories are here that we're talking about. Um, up until last month, the only federal legislation that existed was the FMLA, and that was passed in 1993 by Congress, and it guaranteed uh, unpaid leave. So you did not have a right to get paid by your employer, but you did have a right to take the leave, and your job was protected while you were on the leave. Um, and then Separately, we now have uh, new federal legislation on both paid sick leave and paid family leave. 
if we can advance to the next slide, the new federal paid sick leave law. So this was enacted on March 18th in the Family First Coronavirus Response Act. And what it did was that for workers who are covered, it gave them 80 hours of paid sick leave to be taken this year. Um, these protections expire at the end of 2020. Um, the reasons for leave are several. Uh, they are all COVID-19 related. So um, while this is a big step forward, and we do think that there are millions and millions of workers who are now going to be getting access to paid sick leave for the first time, it's also limited because it's only uh, COVID-19 related reasons for taking leave and it also expires at the end of the year. And then really significantly, there's just a huge swath of employees who are not covered at all, uh, either because they work for an employer that has 500 or more employees or because uh, the recent regulations that the United States Department of Labor issued around the small employer uh, exemption, it's, it's a waiver, not an exemption, in the legislation was so broad that um, many, many employers who are small employers will not have to provide child care related sick leave. And so what that means is that um, employees could still, employees of those small employers could still get paid sick leave to care for themselves or, or a loved one if they were actually sick, but not because their children's school was closed or childcare provider was unavailable. Um, on the question of immigrant access to these new paid sick leave and paid family leave benefits, um, in both of these cases, these are benefits that are paid directly to employees by their employers uh, in the same way that wages are paid. And there's just involvement with government agencies unless an employee decides to file a claim uh, alleging that there were violations of one of these laws. Um, and so that is why, you know, that's, um, there's no reason why uh, people should see any kind of difference in the way that they are able to access paid sick leave based on their immigration status other than the overarching difficulty that undocumented workers have in accessing kind of any employment protection, which is the kind of constant threat of uh, retaliation from their employers. I will say one thing that is tricky is that um, many immigrant workers, many undocumented workers are employed off the book. And uh, for those workers, it may be harder to get these uh, new paid sick leave and paid family leave protections because their employers are not going to be getting the tax credits on the back end that the legislation created that would allow them to offset the cost of providing the leave because both the new paid sick leave and the new paid federal leave um, were established in such a way that employers have a uh, tax credit coming to them for the leave that they have provided. So let's advance to the next slide on the new federal paid family leave. So in terms of coverage, this new protection is very, very similar. And what's different about it is that um, the reasons people can be eligible to take it are different. Uh, the new paid family leave protection only applies to people who are unable to work because they have minor children that they are caring for whose school or childcare is closed. Uh, and this is up to 12 weeks. The first 10 days are unpaid. The presumption is the person will be getting paid that way through the prior program I just mentioned, the paid sick leave program. And then from there, there's an additional uh, 10 weeks and it is paid at 67% of their wages. If we could advance to the next slide on state and local paid leave laws. So there were already many states and localities that had paid sick leave and paid family and medical leave. Um, and so you should really check what the protections are in your state. Um, not all of those laws have language that would allow them to cover public health emergencies or quarantine orders. So we've listed there on the slide the ones that are uh, particularly relevant now. Um, access for immigrants to these programs, the state paid family leave uh, program varies from state to state. Uh, generally speaking, we can say that immigrants are eligible for paid family leave programs in California, New York, and Washington state. 
Um, and in other states, it may be a matter of advocacy, or you should probably just check with advocates in your state. On the next slide, we're going to talk about unpaid leave. So this is um, included in part because one of the strange things about the federal legislation that passed was that even though it's called uh, emergency paid family and medical leave, it doesn't actually cover you if you're an employee who gets sick <laughs> and, you know, with a long-term illness or your family members, right? It only covers uh, the child care closures, the school and child care closures. So there may be some people who um, will want to try to access unpaid uh, family and medical leave if they themselves become ill or have family members who become ill. The eligibility uh, is a little bit more complicated um, because the employees need to have already worked with the employer for over a year and there's other kind of uh, criteria for who's eligible for FMLA leave, but this is a type of leave that is protected, provided to all regardless of status. On the next slide, um, I wanted to talk briefly about some considerations with regards to taking leave for immigrant workers. So um, under both the FMLA and the Families First Coronavirus Response Bill, um, there, all workers who take leave under those bills are protected against retaliation. And employers should just return those workers to their jobs or an equivalent position upon their return. Um, there is a small employer exception to reinstatement under the FSCRA, so you should look at that if that is uh, applicable to your situation. Under immigration law, the way that it is structured, employees who are on leave and then come back from a leave of absence are considered to be continuing their employment. And so when they return, there's no requirement under immigration law that their eligibility for employment be re-verified because it's not considered a hiring under immigration law. And so um, workers and advocates should be aware that if employers do try to re-verify someone's eligibility for employment at that moment, it may indeed violate state or federal anti-discrimination and anti-retaliation laws. If we could advance to the next slide, I'll just talk briefly about some of these different state and local responses to gaps uh, for immigrant communities in these federal programs. So as I think folks are probably very well aware, uh, and as the other webinars in this series that NILC is putting on this week kind of go into extensively, there's just many, many ways in which immigrant, uh, immigrant workers and immigrant families are being left out of the federal response. And so um, there, many of them are not going to be eligible for the stimulus payments. They're not going to be eligible for unemployment benefits. They may not be eligible for um, health care. And so um, on, in many places around the country, states and localities are looking at ways that, I'm, that they might be able to um, fill some of these gaps. And of course, it's a very challenging proposition. Um, and yet there are some very exciting developments happening. So uh, just to give you a sense, and I will also say this is something that we are working with folks on right now. And so if you are working on something similar, we'd love it for you to get in touch with us um, because we want to do whatever we can to support these efforts. But just to give you a sense of what folks are looking at, there are a couple different states that are uh, looking at the creation of something styled as a disaster relief fund, which would be for workers who are ineligible for unemployment, um, you know, temporary disability or paid family leave, and unable to work due to the pandemic. Uh, there are states that are looking at expanding their state earned income tax credit to include ICIN filers, um, and even potentially making those refunds available on a quarterly basis. Um, there are people looking at existing paid family leave and temporary disability insurance programs which are accessible to immigrants and seeing if they can be amended to cover pandemic related reasons for leave and then there are also cities and states that are creating um, kind of joint public private funds where they're doing things like for example distributing money to social services providers to help with utilities or food or medical or rent 
related expenses and also um, distributing money to nonprofits to give cash to individuals who um, you know can meet different criteria that are established in these local efforts. But you know, a typical example is someone who is under 200% uh, of the federal poverty level and can demonstrate that they're suffering economic hardship and they're ineligible for other forms of assistance. So those are just some ideas and that's all very exciting work that's evolving very quickly. Um, there are several different states that are looking at both executive and legislative action around these fronts. And so um, it's definitely an area to plug in and to stay tuned. If we could advance to the next slide, I think um, that wraps up my presentation. Thank you so much, Jesse. Just want to remind folks we, that this, this presentation is being recorded and these resources are going to be available on NILK's homepage, the NILK website, and NILK's Facebook page, along with the recorded version of this webinar. And we will encourage you to access these resources that are listed here on, on this page, including the FAQ on Immigrant Workers' Rights and COVID-19, which is going to be updated as policies and, and new protections evolve. Next slide, please. We want to move into our Q&A section. If you wish to ask a question, um, please use the questions box located on the right side of your screen to enter your question at any time. And we will begin with our first question. Our first question um, relates to worker health and safety. Uh, the first question is um, for Emily. Um, could you talk more about the complaint process? Does one file with federal OSHA or with the state agency, and where would one find a complaint form? What information would they need to include, and how do they find more information on who can help file a complaint? Yeah, okay, great question. Emily? Thanks so much for that. Um, let's talk about some of those bread and butter filing a complaint issues. I may have zoomed past some of these in my presentation. So um, complaints can be filed in any language um, and OSHA will attempt to pair um, the complaint with an investigator who speaks that language, if that's a possibility. Um, advocates or attorneys can also um, act informally as a translator if they have that capacity and wish to do so. Um, you can file a complaint by phone or online. In normal times, you can actually physically go to an OSHA office, but now it's by phone or online. You can request that OSHA keep the names of the workers named in the complaint confidential. Um, and in that complaint, and I should say uh, that is OSHA's practice, even if you don't affirmatively state it, but we always think it's a good idea to, to ask to keep the names confidential in that complaint. In the complaint, you're going to want to state um, conditions, violations that you think um, are prohibited by the OSH Act. So if you have a specific standard, a specific rule that you can cite to, like there isn't water and soap, there's a specific standard for that, feel free to cite to it and talk a little bit about the conditions at the workplace. If you don't have that and you think um, what's happening at the workplace violates the general duty clause, I would talk about specific examples that you think do that. Um, you're going to want to give the address of the employer, and um, just in terms of logistics, there is a form available online that you can use for many people, particularly if there's an attorney or advocate helping to draft, you're going to want to attach a complaint, right? So you can just say, see attached complaint on the actual form itself. Um, generally, though, I think it's worth noting that uh, I, I don't know how, um, how many folks caught this. There is an ability for organizations to file on behalf of workers. That process is through an employee designation process. It's not as complex as it sounds, um, but it's essentially the worker electing for the organization to file a complaint on their behalf. There are also examples that I've heard from advocates who they themselves, the advocate or the attorney, has filed and has stated that there's a current employee who's experiencing the hazard and goes on to file in that way. Again, that isn't a formal practice, but it has been um, done in the past. So folks should feel free. I should also say on the, OSHA, um, on the OSHA Law Project's website, there's an entire toolkit with all you could ever want to know and more about how to file a complaint. So feel free to check that out as well. Thanks, Emily. Another quick question for you as well. Uh, who is covered by the OSHA standards? Uh, does it matter in the employer size, the industry? And do the federal standards, including the new guidance, apply to all the states that have their own plans? 
Okay, so generally on standards, um, it depends is the answer. There is a set of standards, a set of rules that apply to general industry. So that would apply to most employers and in most industries, manufacturing, construction, agriculture, healthcare, et cetera. And then there are standards for specific industries that relate to protecting workers from hazards in those particular industries, right? Um, so, you know, you would see specific standards for um, maritime workers, agricultural workers. There are specific sort of um, things that address hazards that workers typically encounter on those jobs. If you're in a state plan state, the state agency enforces its own rules and standards itself. OSHA is not the enforcing body there. If you are not in a state plan state, OSHA will be the one who enforces the rules, the standards, the general duty law. So it depends on if you're in a state plan state, you're looking to your state as the enforcement agency. If you're not, then you're looking to OSHA as the enforcement agency. And the last question on this topic for now is how can an organization file on behalf of workers? Are there any limitations to that? So generally, again, I would encourage folks to check out that toolkit or to contact me offline. I'm happy to talk more. It, the, um, the typical way that folks would do this would be that the workers would designate the organization as sort of acting on their behalf, filing on their behalf, and the organization would um, essentially stand in the place of workers for the purposes of the complaint. So yes, there's a way to do it, and there's a specific form that folks can use to do that. Okay, great. Thanks, Emily. So now we have some questions for Ingrid on collective action. Ingrid, uh, you talked earlier about what workers are covered by the NLRA, the private sector, not agricultural or domestic workers. Is, is there a distinction there? And are there any protections for those workers who are excluded? Um, for example, agricultural independent contractors, what advice would you have for those workers taking collective action in this moment? Um, I guess I would, so the question, uh, as I understand it, I'll take the second one first, is whether or not there's a distinction between independent contractors and, mm -hmm. can you repeat that portion? Yeah, are there protections for those workers that are not protected or excluded under the protections of the NLRA okay. for any reason? So uh, for people who are protected, so let me just take that first, for the, for the folks that are protected by something else, like the Railway uh, Labor Act, um, you know, there are, there's a certain kind of protection for workers who are organizing for a union under that statute. Um, supervisors and anybody who's a supervisor or manager uh, would not, doesn't have protection. Uh, they are an at-will employee and are subject to the whims of their employer. Um, there may be, in certain states, uh, there are agricultural protections for agricultural workers. And in various states, there are, um, as many of people on the call probably know, uh, Domestic Worker Bill of Rights. Uh, you know, I, and I couldn't speak to the extent of the protections that those state statutes would provide for those workers. Um, but that would be something to look at as well. Yeah, I know New York has more protective uh, legislation of the New York Human Rights Law for domestic workers. So folks in New York definitely might want to take a look at that and folks in other states may also want to look at that legislation as model legislation for their state as well. Um, this, another question we have for you, Ingrid, is many workers continue to be inadequately protected in their workplace. Does not having PPE or personal protective equipment rise to the level that would allow a union worker to legally refuse to work or would non-union workers who refuse to work be protected against retaliation if they were demanding PPE? Well, workers uh, would certainly be protected if they were demanding PPE and took collective action to make that demand. Um, and I, when I say take collective action, I'm including all forms of collective action, not, uh, not specifically work stoppage. Um, if they w engage in a work stoppage, you know, whether or not it's a protected act or not depends partially on their, you know, whether they're under a no strike clause or not. Um, and can you repeat the other, the first part of that question? Are they? Uh, does not having PPE rise to the level that would allow, for example, two union yeah. workers to, to act, right. collect, act collectively, so refuse, refuse to work. To work. Yeah. So, 
again, so there's, there's not having PPE uh, is certainly a working condition that if you took collective action about would be protected collective action. If you are under a no strike clause, refusing to work uh, is a problem. You can't refuse to work when you're, you know, working under a contract where you've promised the employer you're, you're going to continue work and you're not going to stop working. Um, it won't, you know, whether or not it, it falls in that special category of 502 or not uh, is, is hard to know. I don't, we have, my colleagues and I have talked about that. In most cases, we think if we can address the issue in advance, uh, we will. If we can address it in advance, it's not something that would fall under that the 502 rubric. Um, we have, and, and then the other thing I will just say is kind of a side note on PPE, is that some of the difficulty around PPE is that there isn't enough of it nationally. So early on, some of our uh, workers at the union were asking for masks. Well, there, there, there weren't masks. There, you know, they were asking for the type of surgical masks or something that would protect them uh, would clearly protect them, such as medical workers have. And in New York, I mean, there's not even enough to go to the workers in the hospital. Uh, some of our airport workers were asking for gloves, and the employer didn't have any and couldn't get them because they were, you know, the places that they would get the supplies from were out of them. So there's, there are those sorts of practical problems that are happening. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, you know, what the context is. I think in most cases, if, uh, this is what I would say is a guiding principle. If you can figure out a way um, to plan, to take collective action to correct something, A, that's something that you should do, and B, it's going to indicate to you that it is probably not something that falls into the second category of being so abnormally dangerous that the person who refuses to do it would be protected under either the 502 section um, of the uh, Labor National Relations Act or, um, or the OSH 11C. Just to, just to summarize on that point before we move on to the next question on UI and employment insurance. So even short of taking the, the work stoppage, just you know, taking collective action to demand uh, personal protective equipment that would be protected under the NLRA. Correct. The, correct. And and we have done that. I mean, there are um, some of the workers that we are organizing with in Connecticut who work at the rest stops um, in the various fast food outlets there, uh, you know, did do drive by, did a drive by uh, protest and a, uh, I actually don't understand exactly, they did some sort of online directed at their manager uh, action as well. Um, but yes, you can take, collective action is definitely protected. It's only when Great. you, that is why I said, when you get to strikes, just think about the strikes in a little bit of a different category. While it's still protective action, there are more wrinkles there. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much, Ingrid. And we, again, folks will be able to, to reach out to our panelists um, and to NILC and to, OSH and NELP for, for further guidance and resources, again, after the presentation. I uh, want to move to the next question we have on unemployment insurance for Rebecca. Uh, Becky, could you re re reiterate what categories of immigrants are eligible for regular unemployment insurance and any difference with the new federal PUA, which covers undocumented workers, item holders, H2, H2B, guest workers, double holders, et cetera? I just reiterate for us the delineations here between who is eligible for regular UI and any differences with the new federal PUA. Rebecca, I think you're mute. Your line is muted. You just need to unmute. I sure do. Thank you. Um, so the basic rule for unemployment insurance is that a worker needs to have work authorization and they need to have work authorization during the time they worked and established what's called a base period. So that's going to be anywhere between 12 and 18 months of work. 
had to have work authorization during that time, and they have to have work authorization now as they are applying. So undocumented workers won't qualify. Workers with ITINs cannot apply with an ITIN. But a worker who has work authorization should apply. And you'll be asked generally for work authorization, sometimes social security numbers, sometimes both. And that depends on the state. Um, the, so that is the basic rule. I, I get a lot of questions about H2A and H2B. And here's what DOL said um, many years ago. They said that um, H2A um, or H2 and other uh, temporary visa holders could, could establish a base period because they had work authorization during that time, but that it was unlikely that they could show that they were able and available to work. So there might be some room for some individual advocacy in those cases. Um, for, right. yeah, and we just don't know for PUA because there is no guidance on PUA. Okay. Uh, before we move on to the next question, just wanted to make sure we answered this late breaking question that, just to clarify once again back on collective action that undocumented workers uh, who take uh, joint action, that's two or more workers who take action to demand PPE, uh, from what we understand, are protected under the National Labor, Section 7 of the National Labor Relations Act, uh, unless they're in an excluded category, which is protected under another provision, but for the most part, they are. Isn't that correct, Ingrid? Ingrid, I think you may be on mute. Just wanted to clarify again that undocumented workers are protected if they demand PPE under the Section 7 of the NLRA, correct? I think, Ingrid, you're still muted. <laughs> Sorry, that's the resounding yes. I was saying yes, yes. <laughs> okay, great. I um, want to make sure. We want to make sure people leave. Uh, if they have a takeaway, yes. that's one of the biggest takeaways. There's, Thank you. Right. Yeah. Okay. So the next question uh, for Becky is, uh, what do some applicants for asylum mean? What about other immigration status work authorizations, for, for example, you or VAWA applications? Right. If you have work authorization, you will qualify for at least basic unemployment insurance. So folks with work authorization should apply, and the states have to determine whether you're eligible for regular UI before they look at PUA. So folks with work authorization should definitely apply. Great. Thank you. Um, next question is, what if your employment authorization has expired and is pending renewal? That's probably a situation that we want to talk about more offline. Um, there may be some room in an individual case for some advocacy in that case. Okay, great. And then lastly, um, what does forced to quit as a result of COVID-19 mean generally? Yeah, so DOL has interpreted the law pretty narrowly and given examples that are pretty narrow. But my reading is that the states are free to make it more broad. Um, DOL would say if your business is closed because um, of an emergency order, then definitely that's forced to quit because of COVID-19. If you have to quit because you are infected. Um, that would be forced to quit because of COVID-19. The cases that I think are a lot more, um, a lot less clear are if you have to quit because your workplace has become unsafe. And that's really a matter of state law. State laws are, some state laws are more generous and say that if you have to quit because of um, safety, you can qualify for unemployment insurance. Others are not. Thank you so much, Becky. And so we have two general questions now. One is about public charge considerations. Folks are familiar with the new public charge rules promulgated by the Department of Homeland Security and also the Department of State 
Will unemployment insurance count against somebody? And what about paid sick leave and paid family leave? Um, I know. I'm going to defer to my colleague Jesse to answer these questions, but I can also share some answers there as well. Yeah, I think there's probably multiple folks who could answer this question, but I think um, all of those are uh, programs that are considered earned and uh, earned benefits and will not count in the public charge determination. So we've seen this question a lot. Um, unemployment compensation, uh, state or federal family leave, workers comp, uh, disability leave. These are all things that are looked at as uh, earned benefits. And for that reason, they are not going to be taken into account by USCIS uh, if immigrants are uh, petitioning USCIS for immigration status benefits. Thank you, Jesse. And the next general question is, what about workers' compensation? Is that an avenue that would be available to undocumented workers uh, in the era of COVID-19? I can take a stab at answering that question. Uh, possibly, uh, but they may be very difficult to bring. Undocumented immigrant workers are generally eligible for workers' compensation benefits in, uh, in almost every state. Um, there are some exceptions that are available in our FAQ. Um, but they're either explicitly or implicitly included in workers' compensation statutes and are protected. However, a worker would need to demonstrate that her COVID-19 infection occurred during the course and in the scope of her employment. And this is very challenging to prove during a pandemic if uh, the employer could, for example, introduce evidence that the, the worker uh, you know, took a detour and went somewhere else before or after work and then caught COVID-19. That would be very difficult. And of course, you would need to get uh, likely medical evidence to, that, to show the diagnosis and to show that uh, the, that the exposure was very was unique to uh, the work. And for the most part, healthcare workers and, and potentially uh, other other essential workers may be able to demonstrate this because they are being asked to work by state and local governments during this time when most folks are being, also being asked to stay home. So they they are uniquely exposed to a higher risk. Um, of contracting COVID-19. Uh, but if you have more questions about that, please consult the FAQ. Uh, that resource will be updated as, um, as new resources come out. There are other states that have already acknowledged, like Washington, uh, that they are recognizing COVID-19 under uh, workers' comp claims, particularly for healthcare workers. Um, so the next, and I know we're, we're running very close to time, but I wanna make sure we get to as many questions as possible. Um, the next question um, regarding, uh, let's see, if there's anything else we can we can address here. Um, do folks know about, so some employees have been told by their employers that they must go get tested and provide a letter confirming that they do not have the virus in order to return to work, return to work. However, obviously, in many places, counties don't have enough tests and healthcare providers will not provide referrals for testing unless they feel it's warranted in usually very dire situations and it can be very costly and hard to come by free of cost. Do these employers have the right to require testing and do employees have any recourse if they're not allowed to work without a letter confirming they are negative? Oh, well, if folks have more questions about this, please feel free to contact our folks. Um, offline and, and we can potentially answer those questions. Um, we wanna thank everyone again for joining us today. We wanna make, uh, make sure folks are uh, reminded about the fact that this presentation will be recorded. And we wanna make sure people stay informed and follow NILF's Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can contact any of the panelists here today at the emails here on this slide. and we want to thank everyone once again for joining us and to join us again tomorrow uh, for the third webinar in this series, the three-part series. We want to make sure folks are aware that tomorrow's webinar is on equal opportunities to thrive, rebate, taxes, social security numbers, iTunes, food security, and access to food programs. We hope you and your loved ones are safe and well and that you can join us again. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to our panelists and to Nilk, the uh, the OSH project and NELP and, and 32BJ and all of our panelists here today. Thank you once again, and please stay informed and stay safe and healthy. Thank you.